I do want to just pray very briefly one more time. I know Rebecca has, but it's, it's helpful for me, and I think it's helpful for us. Um, Heavenly Father, when we read a chapter like this, it's dense, it's long. There's a lot in it. We do pray that by your Holy Spirit, who was present and helped Paul write this, and by your Holy Spirit, who was present as I prepared Would you, by your Holy Spirit, be here now with us, that we might listen, and that everything Rebecca prayed earlier would come to pass. We would be warmed, turned to you, for the first time or for the millionth today, in Jesus' name. Amen. In uh, September 1943, in the middle of World War II, a Mr. and Mrs. Hartley, a British couple, received a telegram informing them that their son, the captain of a, a bomber, Aeroplane had been shot down over the Atlantic, that he was missing, and the chances of rescue were slim. For those younger ones, a telegram is like a WhatsApp message on paper. (laughs) The chances of rescue were slim. Now, I can't imagine a parent in that case not holding out hope. And there's hope in that message. Chances might be slim, but they're still there. I mean, would any of us give up hope if it was us? Eleven days later, they received another telegram. Delighted to inform you that your son, E.L. Hartley, is safe. Eleven days. Their hope came to pass. And they were some of the lucky few. My great-grandmother received a telegram like the first to tell her that her son, Vincent, who was a navigator in a bomber, had been shot down over the Mediterranean. She never got the second one. I wonder how long she held out hope for. Hope is a very powerful thing. Uh, It keeps us looking forward. It keeps us moving forward. Guys who've, uh, people who've researched uh, life in the concentration camps in World War II, they would um, say that the minute someone gave up hope, and you knew they'd given up hope, they just sort of, one morning they just stopped wanting to get out of the bed. They would would die very soon afterwards. Hope is what kept them going in that. And I want us to think about hope this afternoon because of the conclusion here today after three chapters, three very intricate chapters in Romans. So Paul has wrestled with us. He's wrestled with God over whether God could be trusted to keep his promises to us because not all the Jews in Paul's day, the people of God's covenants, had believed in Jesus, who was the Messiah of God's covenants. So if God couldn't be trusted then, well, can he be trusted now? And had the message of the gospel going out to people other than the Jews meant that God was had given up on plan A, he was trying plan B. Um, And chapter 11, I think, is kind of a crescendo of hope, of hope for God's plan to come to fruition. And that is how I want us to think of this chapter and what Paul says in there. So I want us to jump in, very briefly have a look at verses 1 to 10 and and our first point, which is just simply this, that God had not given up on the Jews. So verse 1 says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Has God given up on his people? No, absolutely not. The first clue, well, Paul himself is a Jew. Remember, Christianity's first converts were all Jews. Jews kept on believing in the Messiah. Jews keep on believing in the Messiah to this day. Paul goes on to say that there was historical precedence for this idea that out of the people of Israel, there'd be a small remnant, a small number. And he takes us back to Elijah, who lived around 900 to 850 BC, who at some point was so disheartened at the lack of faith in God that Israel had. He, he got, it seemed like a really emotional oak. He got to this one point. He was like, Lord, there's no one else. I'm the only one. Just start over with me. There's none left. And God said to them, well, actually, I do have 7,000 still left. My plan with my people is still going. I think I've got it there in verse 4. Yes, I've left 7,000 for myself. Now, it's helpful to remember here that this, uh, the people he's left, a remnant chosen by grace, God says, is not a set of nice, decent, honest, hardworking people who will believe well, we're back to thinking that our righteousness with God is based on our works. Rather, verses 5 to 10 of chapter 11 are confirmation that it's the grace of God, the gift of God that will always be in operation. God will always extend His grace to whom He chooses. That's for certain. 
So we actually have chapters 9 and 10 in a nutshell in those verses. God elects by His grace, and His election stands, but Israel are held responsible for their decision to reject Jesus and therefore God. And so Paul asks the question, is this the end for Israel? Is God through with them? Well, have a look at verse 11. He comes back to that question. I ask then, have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not. In fact, God uses the uh, rejection of Jesus, their transgression, um, for something else, the salvation to come to the Gentiles. But, but before we get there, actually, I just want to flesh out this, this whole question of his dealing with the Jews in our second point, which is that God is not finished with the Jews. Their hardening is only partial. Um, so we're going to skip ahead to verses 25 to 32. So there, verse 25, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has been come in. So it's a, a just take one step back there. Thanks, Leon. So God has chosen to save by grace these Gentiles, it's people like us, non-Jews, and until that isn't finished, um, or when that is finished, rather, God will bring the remainder of the Jews in. And then in verse 26, you can go to the next one, we read that all Israel will be saved. Now, this is a tricky phrase, all Israel, especially because in our backs of our minds, we've got the the nation of Israel, the modern nation of Israel as well, and I I almost don't want to go down that road today because I don't think Paul does. Um, We want to ask the question, who is all Israel? It cannot be the entire nation of Israel at that point because many of them hadn't believed in Jesus. And up to today, many still don't. It can't be that God saves some people through Jesus and the others He saved because they're Jewish. Because then the whole point of a Jewish Messiah fulfilling the Jewish Scriptures would be useless. It could be that he means spiritual Israel, which we've seen before in chapter 9, which includes Gentiles and Jews, the the true believers in both the Old and the New Covenants. But it could also just be all in the sense that we sometimes use all as a catch-all phrase. I think it's the simplest choice. You know, Occam's razor, whatever is the simplest, might be the right wing. So we could say, all of us were listening to the sermon. And it's right in some sense, we're all sitting here. Um, one or two of you could be on your phone looking at the Bible passage. Some of you are just dreaming about sport or sleep, or just wandering off and not listening because, yes, this is quite a complicated passage. It's still not wrong to say all. The word all is actually used in verse 32 as well. We were told God may have mercy on all. I mean, just experience tells us that that's not everyone. But all would be people from all nations, from Gentiles and Jews. He will have mercy on anyone, and that anyone will make up the all in verse 26. Now, whoever this all Israel is, we do see there in verse 25, as well as earlier in verse 12, that Paul foresees a great turning of Jews to Jesus. Whether that's gradually over time, whether it's in one big conversion, we don't know. What it does mean at the very least, and I hope this is kind of an obvious statement, is we don't want to withhold the gospel from Jews, Jewish people we meet. In fact, the presiding bishop of our denomination, we should have had a little video interview with him, he uh, was a Jew who turned to Christ. And so, so I think it's important for us to remember that God is not finished with the Jewish people because He does not forget His promises. In verse 29, we read that God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. He's not going to change them. So at the end of these three chapters, as much as this has been a real struggle for Paul, and he's wrestled in it with us, I think he's actually exceptionally hopeful. He's hopeful that the Jewish rejection of Jesus will not last forever. That after some time, he would get the telegram, Paul, delighted to tell you that your brother, your sister, your mother, your daughter, your father, uncle, they have been found trusting in Jesus. And it's what gives Paul his real heart and desire in these chapters to see the Jews rescued. Whatever else this passage means, I think at the very least it points to the fact that God is not done with the people of 
well, the Jewish people. And you and I, who generally speaking are Gentiles, we want to remember that. In fact, the next point actually t- talks specifically to Gentiles in the church. And so I want to leave the idea of hope for a little bit and come back to it later and just touch on the idea of humility. So the church in Rome at the time that Paul spo- uh, wrote was now a mix of Jewish and Gentile believers, and they had to interact with one another in humility. The next uh, three chapters are going to be kind of fleshing that out a bit for us. And to stop Gentile believers from thinking that they had somehow grasped what the Jews were too thick to grasp, Paul says to them, guys, you have benefited from the Jews' rejection of Jesus, so remain humble. Look at verses 11 to 16. I ask then, have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if their transgression brings riches for the world and their failure brings riches for you Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Here you go, clear. Insofar as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my own ministry. I'm a Jewish man who goes around telling Gentiles about Jesus, and I want the other Jews to see me do it so that I might make them jealous and save some of them. The argument is basically this. The Jews rejected their own Messiah, and so the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection went out to the Gentiles. It was spread to them, and God hoped by that that Israel would become jealous and so come back. So imagine a a dad has got three boys, and they go out to play kind of two-a-side soccer on the field. And he and two of his sons start running around. They're playing. The third oak is grumpy. And he doesn't want to play, and he goes and sits out on the, on the side of the, the field. Now, because they one play player short, Dad calls this little oak wandering past the field and says, hey, do you want to come play with us? And so he jumps in and comes playing, and they have an awesome time. It's a fantastic game. And little sulk, in, in, in our home, we might call him the incredible sulk. He sits there, and he's missing out on all of this. And he realizes he's being silly and everyone else is having fun. And so he's spurred on to say, hey, can I come play, please? And that's what his dad wants. That's what the brothers want. They want their butt there with him. And that is what God wants to achieve through the inclusion of Gentile believers. People like us, people not from the nation of Israel, that we have this benefit of being part of the wonderful grace of God and God's plan because of Jewish unbelief. We are the kid walking past on the road. God says to us, come, I want you as well. I want you to be part of this game. I want you to be part of this, this, this good thing we've got here. And the purpose when it comes to the Jews is that they should see in the Christian church, now comprising of a mix of Jews and Gentiles, a community, a family, which is the fulfillment of the promises God had made to them in the Old Testament. In that way, they want to look at the church and go, hang on a second. You guys have what was meant for me. I want it and they'll be led to believe in Jesus. That's one of the things I think God wants from His people. He would love for us to so enjoy being part of His covenant people, so be fulfilled by being brought into His promises and secure in the love that He has promised us, that we're enticing to any Jewish person who sees us. Now, goodness, the church has been rather horrible at that over the centuries. But maybe for us, I am going to go off note. (laughs) My notes were, what if we could be a place like that? I think we very often are a place like that, CCC. I think that being part of this family is a wonderful thing. And when when people come and visit, they go, sure, you guys really look like a tight family. So praise the the Lord for that. I think it's fantastic. Say that with a smile on my face. It's a wonderful family and community to be part of. And we want to keep going at that. We want to show people that having access to the promises of God, believing in the Messiah, is a wonderful thing, and we're grateful for it, and we want people to join in with us. And, and, and I think not just any Jewish person who knows his Old Testament, but anyone walking in here on a Sunday, anyone seeing us interact with each other, we want them to look at what God has given us and go, I want that. I want what you guys have. It's great. I think one of the main attitudes that we need for, need for that 
is one that Paul highlights in this chapter, and that's an attitude of humility. And he does that by um, using the imagery of an Old Testament, I'm um, sorry, of an olive tree. And the olive tree in the Old Testament is a picture used to describe Israel. So any, any Jewish person reading this would go, he's talking, about, he's talking about us. And the root, safe to say, is Abraham, the patriarchs, the branches he speaks of as having been broken off, are the members of Israel, the, the Jewish people who have not believed, the ones who rejected Jesus. The wild olive branches grafted in are us, Gentile believers in Jesus, who are now part of this spiritual descendant of Abraham. We brought into this tree. We feed off the history and the beauty of it all. So in verse 18, he says, don't be arrogant towards the branches broken off. Don't say about those broken off, yeah, they're so thick, man. How can they not see what I've seen? You know, because by implication, we're saying we're much better than they are. We got it. You didn't. And he says in verse 18, we're, we're part of the people of Israel in a sense. We, we came in later. We're not where it began. So we can't take credit for it. Then we could also be presumptuous by saying there in verse 19, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. We were grafted in, but not because we were special and deserving. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace. If you go back to the, the dad with the soccer with the kids, he didn't kick out the incredible sulk so that he could bring in the guy on the side of the road. That little guy sat on the side because he rejected dad's offer of fun. He didn't want to play. And the wandering kid is joyous to be part of the game, and he plays in faith that when the son comes back, the dad's not going to say, fine, we don't need you anymore. If Gentile believers, if any of us start thinking that we deserve to be part of the tree, um, rather than realize that it's the gift of God which has allowed us to be in, he says to us, he warns us, well, you can be broken off too. All of us as Christians, verse 22 says, are to continue in the kindness of God. Now, I know that when we read verses 19 to 22 and we read words like fear this and otherwise you too will be cut off, we kind of get a little uncomfortable and, and, and we start worrying. Wasn't chapter 9 all about God's word remaining true and his people being certain that they can be rescued? This sounds like something can happen which... God can say, I don't want you anymore. But the section, remember, is about avoiding presumption. True faith is dependence, not presumption. Israel presumed, because they were physically descended from Abraham, that nothing they did, no matter how evil, had an impact. They rejected the kindness of God, and the warning for us is the same. If we are truly part of God's chosen people, we are not going to think we're choice people and presume on His kindness. We'll continue living in His kindness, going, man, it's grace that's got me here. Thank you, Lord. We're going to keep going in faith, keep going in obedience. So one author says, he says, here is no talk of losing salvation. It's rather the revelation of counterfeits. People who don't continue in faith just feel like we belong here. Realize, as people who want to be real, real believers that we are dependent on the kindness of God, we're dependent on His grace, His mercy, as our certainty. If I start presuming on the things I do, or the things that I think make me special, I'm going to be showing myself to perhaps not be as chosen as I thought. So don't be proud, don't be presumptuous. It's literally, in this case, by the grace of God, I go. Be humble. Be humble and be hopeful. Remember, um, I said hope was such a powerful theme in this passage. I want us to go back to hope. It's why I wanted Alberto to share that story with, with us, because there are people who we pray for, who for years and for decades we pray for, and for whom we keep holding out our hope that they would turn to Jesus, that God would be merciful. And, and He does it. He often answers our prayers. And I, I just want to say, like, if you're sitting here today and you're not a Christian, someone's invited you, don't want you to feel like you've got a target on your back or anything like that. It's not like that. You're not a project or anything. You're a, you're a loved, prayed-for person. And like Alberto said, uh, people that we have on our hearts, that we really hope that you would meet Jesus as your Savior, as the one who died to bring you to God. That's, that's the hope that we have. 
I, I read a story of a, of a town in the U.S. that was earmarked, um, I guess, for destruction. They were going to build a dam, and the town would be covered with water. So they let the people know, hey, good news, everyone. Um, <laughs> they said to them, this is the plan. You've got, I don't know, 24 months or something stupid to get your affairs in order to find yourself another home, higher ground this time, and, um, and, and, and move out. And what they found was in those months, and it was quite a long time, there were no improvements in the town, understandably. No repairs, no potholes fixed, that kind of thing. The town just got more and more dilapidated. People wouldn't look after anything. They didn't hardly mow the lawn or pull out weeds. It just kind of... Everything just went apart. One resident said, where there is no faith in the future, no hope, there is no power in the present. And got me thinking about our hope. We, we've, we've been, I think, as, uh, you know, in the world, in our country, in our city over the last couple of years, we've had a tumultuous couple of years. Things have really been stressful. I remember chatting to a guy a few years back when we were visiting my parents, and a South African guy I met up with in Sydney, and we, we were talking and we, we came to the conclusion that South Africans' anxiety, base anxiety level is almost like this high compared to the Oaks who live in Australia and New Zealand. And then you add COVID, and then you add uh, uh, the riots and, and the junk we went through last year. I, I think Perhaps more of us than we think have put our heads down a bit, and um, we haven't looked upward, we haven't looked forward, we kind of lost hope, and, and I think we have to remember as Christians, our hope extends beyond economics, our hope extends beyond social issues, our hope extends beyond pandemics, our hope is eternal. Alberto mentioned that, he says, he said, when he said um, the, that people's lives hadn't just changed for the better here, was the better eternal. And that's our hope. We look forward to the future. We live in hope that God will keep rescuing people, that God will keep being merciful to them, that God will keep growing His kingdom. We're not like a people who are just sitting waiting for a city or a world to die, and we're not doing any improvements. We're a people who live in hope of others being brought from death to life, from darkness to light. We're a people of hope. Lift your heads. Lift your heads. Live in hope. Be people who pray. Be individuals. Be a church. Let's be that church who pray that God would keep bringing people into Jesus' kingdom. Let's take chances and invite people to church or chat to them about Jesus. Do what El did and say, guys, read a book with me. And pray and pray and pray that they say yes. It's at the very least, think again about God as the God who is gracious and compassionate and who longs for people to turn to Him and who is a God who can make that happen. Some of you will remember a phrase we used when we launched as a church. We don't want to be a people who believe in the God who can, but probably won't. We want to be a people who believe in the God who can and will. A God who will save people. A God who will grow His church. A God who can save Jewish people and hard-hearted South Africans. Mechanics, HR specialists, teachers, politicians, soldiers, men, women. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation unto all who believe. Every single one. I think it sounds crazy sometimes, doesn't it? That God would die on a cross or that God would use normal sinful people like us to bring about His plan in the world. And I wonder whether that's part of Paul finishing chapter 11 as he does Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He has this plan that is often beyond our comprehension, but that is okay. If you and I understood everything about God, I think it would make him less to bring him down to our level of understanding. There's this scene in one of the Marvel Avengers movies. 
Got to have one of those. Uh, there's uh, Loki, who's um, the, he's the bad guy in the Avengers. He's the villain. He's the Norse god of mischief. And he gets confronted by the Incredible Hulk. Not the Incredible Sulk this time. And the Hulk comes in there, and, rawr, and Loki has a hissy fit, and he says, I've had enough with you people. Don't you know I am a god? Hulk grabs him, smashes him, doo, 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 left, right, walks away like this puny god. <laughs> Which I just think is awesome. <laughs> if you and I could understand everything about God, if we knew what he was doing, it would bring him down, it would make him puny. And if I could grasp God's majesty and understand it all, it would make him less. God has not shown or told us everything that he's doing. And not all of us understand everything he's told us about what he's doing. But at the very least, God has given us a vision, a message of hope. Hope for us as individuals. Hope for Jews. Hope for Gentiles. Hope for our world. Your and my story doesn't end with a telegram that says your son is missing. Your and my story ends with the message that we have been found and we are coming home. Look forward to that. Invite people into it and rest in it. Let's pray. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Father, we want to think of you as big as this in everything, and we want to hold on to the hope that you are the God who can, the God who will, the God who has, and the God we can trust in and hope in for our loved ones and for ourselves. Help us hold on to this today. Amen. 